Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and businesses, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understandings from neuroscience, anthropology, history, business, behaviorism, about curiosity, and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Garrick Jones, and I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage. And today I'm here with one of my other authors, Simon Brown. And we're delighted to be joined by Philippa Neve. Hi, Philippa. Hello. Philippa is an activist and a connector and a consultant and a journalist and a project manager and a writer-editor and a senior advisor on the UN's Lexicon of Electoral Terminology. And we're going to ask more about that in a moment. But Philippa is an expert in electoral assistance, journalism and public outreach. And we are very curious about all she does and what she knows. And it's an honor to welcome you to the Curious Advantage podcast, Philippa. Well, it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. (laughs) We're really pleased to have you with us so that we can have a conversation about some of the things you do and some of the things you know about um, context and language and visualization and working with young people and, and going into completely curious new situations. Is it correct to say that you're an expert in working with young people in difficult environments? And um, perhaps you could tell us some of the most memorable programs that you've run. Yes, I think it's very fair to say that um, that I, I do focus on young people, but not only. Sometimes it's also we're reaching into marginalized groups and we're having to target individual types of, you know, sections of the population who are not getting access to information and things like that. But for the most part, young people are very much the, you know, the, the, the biggest target of, of our work because they're the future. And if young people don't participate in rebuilding their country, because it's what it's about usually in these contexts, then if, if the young people are not behind it, you, you know, you're nowhere. And uh, in fact, to, to answer your question about one of the most memorable things that happened in, in this uh, kind of work was in Tunisia. As you know, we've just had the 10th anniversary of the Tunisia revolution. And after the revolution in Tunisia, um, the United Nations was asked to come and uh, deploy an election assistance mission to assist the transitional authorities to organize the first democratic elections ever in the country. And that's what we do. And because there's no institutional memory of how you run an election, we be, we are these uh, election technicians who come in. So I was faced with a situation with a very young population in Tunisia. And amongst that population, the uh, election, the word election, was actually a dirty word. Why? Because under the previous d- dictator, under Ben Ali, an election meant that he was getting 99.8% of the vote and it just wasn't an election. So the, the young people were disgusted, you know, with the political class and just with even the word election was, uh, was, was difficult. So that, that was the first thing, was to cut, see how can we overcome this reluctance of young people to even believe that actually change is possible, to believe that an election can be something that's actually worth taking part in, and that this time around it's going to be different. So there was, it, there was a huge sort of trust gap, you know. And we, the election teams, uh, the election assistance teams, we're very much in the background. You know, we we assist the the authorities, but we're not at all visible to the general public. You know, our work happens in a very quiet sort of way. So um, I was spending time trying to understand what would be the best way to to reach young people. And of course, as we all know, uh, music is one of the best possible ways in which you can communicate with people in general, but with young people in particular. And so I thought, right, I think what we need to do is to perhaps use music and have a song or have a, have a, have a song that really can, uh, you know, can address these issues that, 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 that these kids are facing, you know, huge, huge challenges, you know, youth unemployment, things like that, you know. 
so you're talking about using tools uh, about around music to build up trust with these young people. Um, how did you do it? Well, uh, I thought we, I have to, the young people themselves have to, have to create this music. It's not me who's going to come along and with a song and say, hey, listen to this. No, it's how can we make a song? How can we find some kids who are motivated? And in this particular case, I was extremely, extremely lucky because I met a woman who was, had been, had had a massive career in, in the music business, uh, and she had retired to Tunisia. And she and I met her socially actually, and I said, "Oh gosh, yeah." You know, she produced some massively, massively famous people. I'm not going to talk about it because she's very discreet, but you know, very famous bands that everybody knows. And uh, so I thought, "Gosh, you know." And I said, "Please, would you ever help me? I'm not a music producer, but I really want to do a song." And so finally, I managed to persuade her. And together we were looking around, and there were quite a lot of young people already doing songs themselves, you know. So we thought, oh, what's going on? And actually the problem was that the political parties were already grabbing hold of these young people. And so then they were already having a political color that we could not possibly use. So we thought, what are we going to do? She says, there's only one thing to do. We're going to go underground. <laughs> it's like... Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> and then it was over to her, and she literally found, you know, this great band of rappers who lived in a garage, literally. And then she found, she found that, so we, we basically put together a, a group of young Tunisians of different musical styles, and they composed this song. And she was not at all an institutional person, and she said, I'm not even going to allow you to give me any key words. You Amazing. have to trust this. You have to trust the kids. Seriously. And it, it okay. had a huge impact, I can imagine. I mean, massive. It massive. became an anthem. Wow. It was amazing. I mean, I think we benefited a great deal from her experience, but sure. also from the talent of these young kids. It was amazing. They're still playing it 10 years later. Fantastic. <laughs> it's amazing. It reminds me um, when Paul Simon was brought in and he found all these incredible indigenous and black um, artists and musicians and created um, alongside them Graceland, that, that Graceland album. Right. And it went global and it was a global hit. But what it had the impact of doing was kind of raising the consciousness of the entire country, no matter what color people were, to say our music is um, legitimate and it's valid and it's loved by the world. And that single act had a huge impact on the kind of identity of South Africa in the world. It was amazing. And the power of music, it just reminds me about what you were doing in Tunisia. But um, what other tools do you develop and use? Well, it, it depends on context, actually, Garrick. Uh, yeah. It really does, because you can find yourself... I mean, Tunisia was a pretty sophisticated environment. I mean, apart from in the countryside, most people can read and write, you know. And you had quite a developed uh, advertising industry and so on, so you can work with those kind of tools quite easily. I mean, if you've got advertising agencies, you can go to them and say, do me a TV spot, you know. But when you go into other locations that are, for example, I'll give you a couple of examples. One was southern Sudan. Now, southern Sudan is, if not the poorest, it's certainly one of the poorest countries in the world. It was suffering from uh, the, the backlash of the longest war in Africa, 21 years of war. And they were getting ready to vote for their independence. There was going to be a referendum. Now, Sudan is a country, southern Sudan is a country that's about twice the size of France. It has, at the time when we got there to, try to prepare the referenda, it had something like seven kilometers of paved road in the entire country, that including the landing strip of the airport. <laughs> so, you know, you're looking at, and then half the year it rains so that it's mud everywhere. They have 132 languages. I mean, wow. and you had a totally traumatized population because they'd been yeah. through the horrors of 21 years of war. So yeah. in that kind of context, it's extremely, extremely difficult. What's more, the level of uh, illiteracy was 80 plus, 80% 80 plus, And there wasn't a single printing press in the whole country. So what do you, you do? You couldn't print anything. 
Which, yeah, how did you solve that one? Because I, I watched your TED talk actually in preparation for this, and uh, I was fascinated to see some of the ways that you addressed it. So I'd, I'd love for you to tell us more. <laughs> well, Sudan, Sudan was very complex. So um, the, the, what I did was I, I actually went into the traditional, disco- tried to discover what are the traditional ways that people share information across these vast uh, stretches of land and jungle and stuff. How do they share information? They they got to be doing it somehow well yes they do they've got the chief and they've got literally got a guy who runs through the jungle carrying a message to the next settlement they literally do that so it's like okay so that's what we're going to do but how do you then guard against message distortion because did the person (laughs) who's carrying the message really understand the message because you're coming up with new concepts and stuff and while he's running across the jungle, he could also you know, forget the message or maybe transform the message because he's got an agenda, maybe. So, you know, there are lots of really challenging things like that. So then there was the way to perhaps do that was to actually get together with the there's a, there was a sort of council of chiefs. Uh, and so through the Council of Chiefs, you were able to persuade the chiefs to, uh, you know, help spread the message and try and guard against message distortion. But, you know, it was extremely, extremely challenging. But you're and, using uh, the resources that are there in the system and in the network already. Yes, yes. I, I also worked with a local uh, group that was done in, in the south of southern Sudan. They'd, they'd done quite a bit of work with refugees and people on things like, you know, post-traumatic violence and things like that and they had used puppets and they made their own puppets because they were able to address very sensitive issues of tribal uh, animosity and things like that through puppets because of course the puppet then is not a human and so you can you can actually get the puppet to say things uh, that um, you know another person would not be able to say so I went down to see them, and you know they were making their own puppets out of scrap and whatever they could find, and they were very effective. So that was also trying to you know trying to harness the local resources and support them, you know, rather than me coming up with some kind of sophisticated idea that's unworkable. And can you tell us a, b- a bit about how you use language as well and the, and the role that language played? Because um, I, I heard you talk about how you know, if people um, don't have a word for something, then they, they can't imagine it. Or um, you talked a moment ago around sort of election being a dirty word in, in Tunisia. So you know, what role have you seen language playing and how have you u- used that in the work that you've done? Well, it's massive. The, the, the role of language is absolutely critical, of course, because, uh, you know, one, the choice of word uh, can send this or that message. And if you, if you choose that, the wrong word, you could send people down a completely uh, erroneous, uh, you know, path of, of, of thought that may lead them to completely, you know, the wrong conclusions. So you want to be exceedingly careful. When when developing these public information campaigns, I mean, it's the choice of words is absolutely vital. So if I don't actually personally speak the language, usually I work in countries where I speak the language, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, I've never really attempted to do a public information campaign in a country where I don't have command of the language. Although 132 languages in Sudan would have been <laughs> <Precisely>. quite impressive. <laughs> I was just coming to that. <laughs> I was like, ah, uh, yeah, in this case. But even also because in a lot of countries you have uh, local, you know, minority languages and so on, so obviously you cannot. But so then what you do is you, you make sure that you rely on surrounding yourself with individuals who do speak those languages. And basically you have to road test everything everything because I can come up with a really snappy nice phrase but in somebody else's language it can have a very different connotation and you can end up in in, you know in a lot of trouble you can end end up insulting people or something without even realizing it yeah. And we found that even with um, our exploration into curiosity, that um, when you translate curiosity in the, into other languages, the meaning changes a little. So in, into German, it goes into neugierig, which is more, or it has, has connotations of sort of nosiness and busybody and that side of things, which is very different to, to sort of how it is in the English language. So Indeed. yeah, amazing the changes that you see. 
yeah. So yeah, no, it's very difficult. And so in some countries, you know, you obviously then some countries like we, that have those multiple languages. Obviously, you have to work with the people, you know, who are speaking those languages. In southern Sudan, they had a radio station that broadcast out of Nairobi that used eight of the main languages that covered most of the population actually. And um, so that was also a choice we made to to try and work in those eight languages out of the thirty two hundred and thirty two. Yeah. What about yeah. visual languages, Philippa? Same thing. I mean, exactly the same. You know, you 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 have to. I mean, especially if uh, when I'm working with the United Nations, it's a very much a, a mindful concern of ours to uh, be inclusive and therefore uh, reach into even the most marginalized communities who, who have very small minority languages. And we have to try and make that effort. Now, we can't always do it because of budget reasons or sometimes, you know, you can't record, you know, X number of radio spots in X number of languages because sometimes you've got multiple, multiple languages. So we do what we try to do that in in the case of Southern Sudan, use the, the you know, eight out of 132 languages and attempt to cover a high proportion of the population in that way. And then talking back about curiosity, so where have you seen curiosity fitting into your experiences? Uh, what role does it play for you? Well, there's there's two sides to this. I mean, there's the 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 curiosity element that's driven me to end up doing this kind of work. But then there's the, the curiosity that my work arouses in other people. Mm. Um, and in particular, when you come to a country that's never experienced a, um, you know, a democratic process, for example, you'll find that people are, for the most part, extremely curious about all of it. You know, how does it work? Why is it better? You know, they, they, mostly people think it's better, but they don't know why. Mm. So they have zillions of questions that... Sometimes you don't have the answer to because they are so curious that they're looking into the corners of certain thinking that it, you know, it never crossed your mind to think about that. So it's challenging. So it's really, really interesting because every time you go into a new context, you're faced with new new questions, you know. So it's that's what keeps it really interesting because every single mission is different. Can we talk about going into a new context? Can I ask perhaps... Have you been able to learn something over the years about how you enter a new que a context or, you know, when you go into somewhere thing new, what are the things that you pay attention to, do you think, to lead your way in? Well, I think perhaps the most important thing, I mean, the most important thing I learned anyway is, you know, I, I was a student of Arabic, the Arabic language, so I studied Arabic. And when I was 20 years old, I arrived in Egypt. I mean, I'd traveled through Europe, but I'd never been outside of Europe uh, at that time. And I arrived in a completely different world. And what was interesting is because I'm, you know, I look like a European, I've got fair skin and, and fair hair, I stuck out a mile away anywhere in Egypt, mm. anywhere. So immediately I became aware of myself in a way that I'd never been before because, you know, I'm not somebody who really thinks about what do I look like walking down the street. But in this case, I really had to. So I was very, <laughs> yeah, because so, all the eyes were on you, you know. And so and so I had to be, uh, very quickly I realized that um, the way you dress is critical and also your, your behavior, how you interact with people. Uh, and... Uh, of course, having some understanding of, 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 for example, here in this case, the Muslim culture, you know, how you you address men and so on is, is very, you know, important because you don't want to... And if you're too friendly, they think you're, you know, inviting them uh, to a more uh, intimate sort of, <laughs> you know. So, so it's very subtle. But uh, And so, you know, I was only 20 years old, but I, mm. I, I, I got it pretty quickly because I actually... It's actually quite obvious, but, you know, having spent, a year, then I spent a year and a half in Egypt and I saw tourists coming along and girls my age wearing, you know, hot pants and no, you know, sleeveless uh, tank tops on the street and then complaining that men were giving them a hard time. Well, mm. they might as well have been naked, you know, to these men. Mm. So, you know, you, there's a, an awareness that, that you, you just build very quickly if you're halfway... Uh, you know, conscious about your environment, you know. 
A curious culture is a game changer. What does curiosity mean for you? Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. And you talk about how you connect with people or the questions you may ask. Or do, Could you say something a little bit about that personal interaction between people of a very different context? Well, to continue on the, on, on the Muslim uh, world experience, because I've had a lot of experience in that part of the world, including I spent seven months in Afghanistan and, you know, yeah. countries outside the, the Arab world. And what I've discovered is that very often uh, I end up being the only woman in the room. And because I'm a foreigner, uh, I become an honorary man. So I get to do whatever I want, <laughs> <laughs> which is quite amazing because people often say, gosh, you know, you go off into these Muslim countries and isn't it really hard? No, it isn't. Because as long as you're respectful, as long as you do try and learn the language, because when I arrived in Afghanistan, I didn't speak Dari or Pashto. I mean, I did then learn some, but, you know, you make that effort mm. and then you dress correctly and, you know, you will... Be accepted as long as, you know, this, it's about being polite. It's about also listening a lot, I think. It's about listening. Mm. And it's about reading people's reactions and being, you know, being mindful that, you know, okay, they perceive you, like I say, I'm an honorary man. They perceive you as a sort of strange creature because you're you're not a man. But nevertheless, you they can talk to you like a man. You know, it's just very, very odd mm. but then i get to be friends with the women too see because because <laughs> then there's no problem i go into the women's quarters and i can you know hang out with the women and go to the steam bath or whatever the hammam and, and things like that so it's quite interesting to be able to navigate those two worlds because they are separate worlds it's mm. interesting so we, we talk in the book about the importance of, of understanding context and when that context has changed so what i was hearing that you described there was very much that if, if you have enough of the basic understanding of the context you can survive and as you as you grow a stronger understanding of that context you can then fit in and build the relationships but as you were describing of the tour there who maybe didn't have that understanding of the certain fundamentals within the new context that they were that was what they wore at home therefore I wear it there and and suddenly you find yourself um, completely missing the impact that uh, that not understanding that context actually has yes and I've learned that you can you can actually insult people without without realizing it you know yeah. and that's something that I'm very mindful of I mean so for example in uh, I, I worked in uh, in 2017, 2018, and 2019 in the Pacific, which is not was not at all my area, but uh, out I went to the Pacific, and I went to these Pacific Islands uh, that uh, there's Vanuatu, and then there's the Solomon Islands. And these islands are quite remote, really, and uh, and you have a lot of tribal people still there, custom, what they call custom people. So these are people literally going around in grass skirts. I mean, you know, they they are and they live in the trees and they live completely connected to nature it's very impressive to see that but then you come along again <laughs> the kids come up to you and they 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 come up to you they they touch you and then they run away screaming because they think <laughs> you know you're some kind of strange creature you know they've never <laughs> seen a white person and um and again you know how how can you possibly connect with with people who are living it's such a radically different lifestyle. Mm. Well, the answer is you, you just sit with them. You sit with them and you make eye contact. Because wow. very often people are afraid of eye contact. Mm. You know? And, uh, you know, I always tend to go and sit with the women first, see how it goes with them. You know, and usually it's no problem. They're very curious. Mm. I'm as curious as they are, you know. We're curious of each other. And you don't have a shared language, but you can use your hands. You can, you know, I usually carry some kind of food or biscuits or something and we start sharing food. And that's often a very good way of breaking the ice. And then you can spend an entire day there, um, not exchanging any words, really, because you don't have words in common. But mm. you can exchange a lot. I'm amazed. Uh, I'm very curious about how you ended up in this and what drew you to this um, metier, if you want? 
<laughs> it's a strange meteor. I mean, it's not very well known. Uh, but it's actually a culmination. It's a, it's actually my third career, really. I started off as a as a journalist. I was a reporter for quite a number of years, and I was investigative. You know, it was my favorite part of journalism because. Because of the curiosity element, <laughs> uh, too. I think in another <laughs> life I might have been a detective. Actually, I, just <laughs> <laughs> I could still do that, maybe. <laughs> and um, you know, and then I moved into more the. I, in my work as a journalist, I went into many difficult situations, and I saw a lot of non-government organisations uh, working on the ground. And I thought, gosh, you know, they're doing some amazing, amazing work. And I thought. You know, instead of observing, why don't I do, you know, why don't I go over to the other side and actually do something about it rather than reporting about it? And the media was already starting to go a bit funny. And so I just thought, right, you know, I'm going to do that. And so I did. And I joined a British uh, charity organization and was with them for six years doing development projects. And then it was by the by. It was it was a very um, it was it it was a curious <laughs> let's say um, uh, coincidence that it was the first Iraqi uh, elections after the fall of Saddam Hussein, mm. and they the UN had put together a massive massive operation to allow Iraqi exiles to vote mm. in fourteen different countries of the world. Gosh. So you can imagine, it was a massive operation. And so they were looking for people who would be able to you know, help run the, the polling stations and all of that. And so somebody recommended me because I speak Arabic and think I was supposed to run, you know, help run the Paris, uh, the Paris uh, voting uh, facility there. And when my contract came through, it said Dubai, you know. I was like, oh, Dubai, Dubai. <laughs> and they said, yeah, no, we need Arabic speakers over there, so can you come to Dubai? So that's what I did. And that's when I met a whole big team of people who were very specialized in election assistance. Hmm. And that's how it all started. That was back in 2004. And, and what, I'm interested in what do you think the skills that are necessary to do this kind of work? Because clearly it's multidisciplinary, right? Um, but what are some of the things, the must-haves that you found you, you had which made you just well-suited for this? I think in my particular area, uh, I mean, of course, yes, it is multidisciplinary and the teams are multidisciplinary. So you have people who are specialized in, you know, legal people who do things like help to write the first electoral law in the country. So they're legal election people. You have legal uh, opera elections operations people, election logistics people, and then me, the public outreach. And how does it, the combination of skills in my particular uh, field was that Yes, I had the media experience from the journalism. I also had the experience of working in, you know, developing countries and also had, you know, that openness, if you like, to the world, having traveled quite a lot already through the journalism. So I think it's absolutely vital to be adaptable. I mean, you don't, you cannot do this kind of work because you're, you, you've got to be flexible, you've got to be adaptable, you've got to be able to think on your feet. And you've got to be open to other cultures, uh, ready to do things in a completely different way, because every time you go to a new context, you've got a whole new way of doing things, a whole new way of working. So, you know, and you can be thrown together with a team of people that you've never met before, and you hit the ground running. I mean, we never have enough time. You, you mentioned openness. Uh, Philippa, can we talk a little bit more about openness? What does that mean to you, and, and what do you think sits underneath openness and the need for openness? I think openness is really uh, the willingness to accept that people think differently than you, they eat differently than you, they look different to you, and that you're actually open to looking at that and saying, well, that's interesting. Hey, you know, I've never met this before. And also openness to be open yourself to other people. So, hey, who are you, this different person? Because, yeah, the people are different to me, but I'm also different to them. So how much of me am I going to be giving to them so that I can actually then, they can feel that they can trust who they've got in front of them, that they feel somehow uh, comfortable in, 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 you know, in the presence of this very strange person? Uh, and I think openness... Is, is very much about taking that risk of revealing part of yourself. And, and that would include certain vulnerabilities. 
so open, being open is actually something that other people can consider a bit dangerous for that reason. Yes. Um, so, yes. And, and I mean, I think, you know, the school of hard knocks does tell you when, you know, how open are you going to be? Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're listening to the Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. One of the things that we talk about is how um, as you go through the process of being curious, it actually builds your confidence. And uh, listening to your story and some of the, the places that you've been, um, did you find that that, that curiosity and you know, experimenting, going to new places, trying things out, that that did sort of continue in a virtuous cycle to sort of build build your confidence the more curious you were? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, I think I've, I've always been curious, you know, as a child, I've always been curious. Yeah, I was curious as a child. And um, I think I'm, I've also been quite fearless. So I think that's that's one quality that if you're curious, you need to be fearless. Otherwise, mm. you you know, you're going to be frustrated. You're curious, but you can't really get that because you're scared, you know. (laughs) So, um, I mean, a lot of the things I've done, people are saying, wow, you did that. It doesn't seem to me to be at all, you know, I'm not, how can I say, uh, impressed that much that, oh, yeah. But (laughs) but other people seem to be. But, you know, I I think (laughs) curiosity and fearlessness do go together. Some people might consider it reckless. Who knows? But, um, (laughs) But no, I think I think I think not everybody's curious, not by any stretch of the imagination. And I think it's something that either you know you can cultivate your curiosity. You know, mm. um, yep. I've never had to cultivate it because I've never had enough time to explore all the things I want to explore. So if something ends, I'm so ready for the next thing. You see. And we found that when you're curious, even if you know you put it into action, even if that doesn't work, um, so your your experiment going somewhere it doesn't work exactly the way you thought, or doesn't turn out how you want, that 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 still actually helps with your confidence to then try again, be curious in a different direction, try something else, um, and and yeah, ultimately allow you to do more. What about well, in- failure? Yeah, well, Sorry, failure, yeah, yeah, look, it yeah. was exactly what I was, where I was going because in this in this particular period, since since the, the, in the past twelve months, nothing that we had planned to do, how we planned to do it, everything that I personally had planned to do, in I'm not talking about my personal life, I'm talking about the project that I'm working on right now. Mm. Yeah. None of it has been possible. I've had to, we've had to, I mean, I'm working with a team of people. We have had to redesign the project from scratch. We've had to rethink how we're doing it. We're in the process right now of, of running the first sort of operational um, side of, of our project. It's not gone at all the way we thought it was going to go, but I'm is, not is, at all. Is that about it not surviving its encounter with the real or the plans once you get into the real situation or is it because the um not because you came in with with preconceived ideas but because the situation is changing all the time around you well it's both things i mean actually the situation is changing all the time but what you thought you knew i mean say for example you know i the project i'm working on is involving the middle east countries which i do know quite well however uh, in the past year uh everything's changed in the way people work, the way people think, the way people operate, you know, we or everywhere. It's not just of course, uh, yes. yeah. So suddenly yep. you're in this new space, and um, the the assumptions that were made in the design of the project turn out to be, mm. you know, sitting on thin air. Yes. So you're trying to run an election in a difficult situation. <laughs> Under pandemic conditions. <laughs> right now, it's not an election. I'm trying to develop a. Uh, I'm trying to develop a, a mass civic education pool because a lot of okay. what I do is, is civic education. See, and so I, yes. you know, quite often found that I'm I'm re revisiting a lot of the same issues uh, over and over again in these areas because. It's what we're talking about are uh, the underpinnings of you know what is a, a, a you know. 
citizen participation, democratic structures, you know, all of those. Civil society. Civil society. So it's the same themes are coming back over and over. And it's also the underpinnings are such like the the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Convention Against the Discrimination Against Women, you know, all of these things kind of come together and you know yeah. you'll read every time i'm redesigning some new way of uh, of conveying these things and so um the project is all about creating a a mass tool that all you youth throughout the region of, of the middle east can use to learn about all of this um and so yeah. Well, it, it would be a long story to describe everything about what's, sure. <laughs> what's changed about the project. But the ultimate goal is to create. We're building a serious game, so it's a. It's and a is mo- it is it digital? Yeah, yeah. It's going to be on mobile phone. So it, yes. because mm-hmm. everybody's now got a mobile phone, and these kids are on their phones all the time. Yes. So it's a. It's what's known as a serious game. So a serious yes. game. You know, a game game for learning. So it's a game about civic participation and all of this. Um, but I wanted to do it in a participatory approach. Mm. That's to say, work with the young people who are going to be playing this game to actually make it. Okay? Yeah. And so <laughs> having to do all of this online instead of in person. Not we're going to be doing workshops <laughs> and hackathons <laughs> and things like that yep. in person. Trying to do it all online has proved to be very tricky. Very I, tricky. I indeed. can imagine. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to come back to your own personal curiosity, if I may. Um, and what at the moment is actually, uh, or what at the moment are you curious about? Well, I am curious about this gaming world because it's a completely <laughs> new world to me. Uh, it's a very steep learning curve, I have to say. I'm working with some outstanding people who are, you know, in their early 30s. And so I'm learning a huge amount from them about mm. what makes them tick, what 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 they are curious about. See, so that's quite interesting because um, you know it's 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 a whole new perspective really. Uh, so that's great. Uh, so I'm, I'm very curious about uh, about all of that, and um, I'm also curious about how I'm going to adapt to this new reality because I feel it's not going away. It's not yeah. like there is no going back to the old um, thing. So I'm actually yeah. quite excited because I feel we're on the threshold of a whole new way of doing things. And, you know, a lot of people are very worried about, you know, social interaction and all of that. And I'm very curious about how social interaction is going to evolve because mm. it is going to change. It already has changed. Yes. So you know, how people choose to interact, how, how social relationships develop and all of that, you know, it's going to change. It is changing in front of our eyes. We were talking about that the other day, just with the uh, the children at the, at the at the dining room table, and they're all becoming more and more conditioned by the games that they're playing online all the time. And so right. some of the interaction becomes very... <laughs> Very unusual or very unexpected or sometimes delightful, sometimes incredibly rude. But it's a whole different – there are different rules in place, it seems. And I think I think I'd think love to explore more, um, perhaps a different podcast, Simon, the idea of serious gaming and curiosity yes. and, and what that means. Absolutely. Um, well, gaming really is brilliant. a whole you know, behavioral uh, field. It's very interesting because, of sure. course, you have – you know, in the high, high uh, period of, of, of video games, you had a lot of, uh, you know, concerns about how young people were becoming desocialized because they were so obsessed by their uh, yeah. games that they wouldn't interact with real people. And there's a problem in Japan, for example. You know, they actually have a whole section of the population that's totally in, in, that's the, right. in the zone, you know. So, but then there's also all this social stuff going on in the games now, which that's is... Right. A whole different thing. Which in the context of the the pandemic, I was hearing, I um, was reading something the other day around how it, the mental health for girls has been um, hit harder than for boys and massively generalizing that boys playing more online games was what their research was finding. And it was through the online games that the boys were socializing and interacting with their friends much more and having positive mental health benefits uh, in lockdown when they yeah. couldn't go out. So uh, exactly. yeah, it's interesting research they've done around that. If there's one thing you would leave with our listeners, what 
do you think it might be? I would say that if you have children, it is vital to cultivate curiosity in your children. Just play games with them, stimulate their curiosity, push them out of the nest as soon as you can to go and explore. Because that will give them the strength and the self-confidence to, to, to grow uh, in the world. I mean, and I, I mean, I think, you know, it's the best gift you can give a child, I think, is to cultivate their curiosity if they're not naturally curious. That would be the first thing I would say. And the second thing is if you don't have children, cultivate your own curiosity. This mm. world is so fascinating. I mean, I've yeah. just moved to a new house and I've got a garden for the first time in my life. I've got all these flowers and plants and, and nothing about it. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is so exciting. <laughs> See? So Wonderful. everything new should be the cause of something. So cultivate your own curiosity, I think, uh, is is also something that, 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 that we need to do. Yeah. Philippa, thank you so much. That's been insightful and enlightening and left us with much, much more to think about. <laughs> thank you so much. You've been listening to Curious Advantage podcast. The Curious Advantage book is available on Amazon Worldwide. Order your copy now to further explore the seven C's model for being more curious. Join the conversation at hashtag Curious Advantage. Subscribe today and keep exploring curiously. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter.